Just talk Let's uh, give him a big round of applause. Steve Whitmar. I thought maybe I was supposed to stop at that mic. You know, it's like I'm <laughs> in front of the Supreme Court or something. Yeah. <laughs> morning, sir. Good morning to you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, sir. And it's everybody else. For this thing. Yeah. yeah, I'm thrilled to be here. It's great fun. So how this is going to work, guys, just so you know, we do have a microphone here. We're going to have a little, we're going to talk a little bit here between the two of us, kind of go over some things in general, talk a bit about what you've done and sure. stuff. But there is going to be ample time for you guys to ask questions as well. That's what that's here for. So I'll give you a heads up when I'm going to be asking my last question and you guys can start to get ready with yours. All right. Cool. Thank you all for being here. It's terrific. Yeah. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you, Swedish chef. <laughs> so I was going to start off basically at, uh, towards the beginning. Sure. It was um, you started working with Henson and uh, the stuff right, pretty much right at the beginning of The Muppet Show. Yeah, well, it was the third season of the show out of five seasons. So yes. It was kind of the middle of The Muppet Show. And um, yeah, I was a, 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 it's, I think it's redundant to say you're a fanatical fan, but I was a fanatical fan yes. and had been for some time. Um, you know, I remember the Muppets from when I was a small child yeah. and I used to beg to stay up to watch Rolf and the Jimmy Dean show back in the <laughs> 60s and stuff like that, you know? Um, and I, I, um, I ended up working with Jim because of Carol Spinney, who many of yes. you probably know as Big Bird. Um, I live, at the time I lived in Atlanta, Georgia, and that's where I was from. And Carol was there as a guest for a puppetry festival. Um, and, and I'd never been to one of these things before, and I thought, oh, puppetry, I should probably think about going. And then I heard that one of the guys from the Muppets was gonna be there, so I had to go. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, you know, it wasn't about looking for a job in any sense of the word. I, you know, that I was 18, and I, I wasn't thinking in those terms. And I just went because I had yeah. to meet somebody who worked for the Muppets. It was so cool. I've actually had the chance to meet Carol a couple of years back. When yeah. They were, when they had that documentary that came out. The, yes. um, the I, and I, I had a chance heard. to meet the man. And he is just a wonderful, wonderful man. He really is. Yeah. He really is. So how long after you jumped onto the show yeah. were you put into the understudy role for, for Kermit? And well, Kermit? It's, that's an interesting story because the, never, actually. Um, there, there was. <laughs> yeah. I, there. <laughs> <laughs> it makes it really interesting it when does, you start yes. doing something and there's no, th there was no such thing as understudies with the Muppets. Yeah. Um, the Muppets were always treated, you know, this was part of Jim's methodology with, with his performers and with his characters. They were treated as individuals, you know, um, like any of us. And, and therefore they were performed by individual performers all the time. Yeah. Well, then I guess, I guess the better follow-up question would yeah. be the, when Jim unfortunately passed. Yes. Um, what was it, how was that discussion that, that how was it came handled? along? Had you that they they came to the final decision that you were going to be the one to take up the mantle of those yeah. characters? Yeah. Well, from what I've been told, and Jim and I never actually discussed this. We, we worked together for about 12 years, yes. from '78 to when he died in 1990, and he had. Um, at the point when he passed away, he was in the process of going through the motions of trying to sell his company to Disney in 1990, and that didn't happen mm -hmm. as a result of his death. But that was the plan. And he thought he was going to be extremely busy as a, as a creative person within Disney and doing his own things. And so I guess he had kind of mentioned in passing, really, to a couple people that, uh, you know, maybe, maybe I would, if I'm too busy to do Kermit, maybe I would ask Steve to do it. Um, and so, you know, it's not like he said, I'm going to pass this to Steve, but he kind of had indicated that I was a, a consideration, just in case. And then, of course, the just-in-case happened unexpectedly, yeah. and we lost him. Um, and then that was really, you know, I yeah. guess it was a follow-through of that of that express, mm -hmm. expression of his. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, I mean, understandably, it must have taken a long time for everybody to rebound from what, when that happened. Yeah. But, so, yeah. It's crazy. But I'm going <laughs> to, just to do a little bit of a, um, I guess, kind of a bit of a roll call. I mean, yeah. it's not only Kermit and Ernie, but Statler, um, yeah. Beaker. Right. Um, lips from Dr. Teeth. Which yeah, is one of yeah. my favorite characters. Oh yeah! Oh, wow. <laughs> He's a little bit more obscure, so I appreciate that. <laughs> oh, I love, I love that. Uh, and uh, obviously, as we saw as we were walking in. Yeah, Wembley. Wembley yes. Sure. Um, but the one, one of the thi one of the things I wanted to talk to you about, and it's going to get into the difference between the the hand puppet and the mm -hmm. full size puppet. You are actually one of the creatures in Dark Crystal as well. Right. Right. So. And so you were you you were in the full size. We were inside of those things. They were called the Skexes. You guys yes. probably know that. And um, 
They were, I, you, you know, if you've heard me ever talk about this, you've heard this before, I considered them to be torture devices. Um, <laughs> and I, I really remember saying at the time, we shot that in England, in London, and I said, these need to go straight to the tower, like the Tower of London, to be right alongside the stocks. And, um, <clears throat> they were designed so that the weight of this, it was a good bit of weight, and, and rather than put it on our shoulders, they, they had these extremely tight harnesses that put this rig on your hip bones which seemed like a good idea because you wanted your arms to be free inside of there, but uh, it was pretty painful and people started developing, this may be too much information, but like calluses on your hip bones, you know, it was painful. And I um, had to imagine back then, a lot of that was like foam latex and stuff, so it probably got even heavier there was the some longer weight to the day it. went on. I think they did what they could to keep it lightweight, but again, yeah, the, you know, the bodies were just filled out with ribbing and things like that, I think, but, yeah. but there were foam attachments and big fiberglass parts. And, you know. and it was just naturally sweating and all that stuff. It, yep, oh, it, yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I can't imagine. But I mean, obviously, it, it's, it's those, the Skeksis are pretty much iconic, but yeah. at the same time, it, it, that's had to have drive, driven you crazy. It, you know, it's a funny thing about that, though. I will say that yeah. um, through, well, two things. One is I've heard women say many times that they had pain during natural childbirth, but they don't really remember the pain. It's sort of the same with the Skeksis. Um, uh -huh. uh, no, I'm not comparing the two levels of pain, actually, but, <laughs> but I don't really remember it as being that painful. I just, I remember saying to my wife, remind me how painful life say this was. <laughs> Well, uh, well, thankfully, yeah. there was no PTSD. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. No, waking up Post screaming. Post-Skexis disorder, right? Waking up screaming right? <laughs> in the middle of the night. Yeah. Just get me out. No. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, one of the more inter well, one of the more fun characters that you've actually got to do uh -huh. was Wembley because yeah. he's so much different and like in his nature than pretty much every other character that you've done. Right. How right. awesome was it? realizing that character. Well, you know, Jim used to say that um, it, it generally took new puppeteers with him about at least five years to settle into a place where they understood the way the Muppets work and comfortable with characters. And that was, uh, you know, there were people who were better than I was at that. Uh, but I, it was about my five-year mark when Jim said, you know, figuratively, he's going to go off and develop things like the Dark Crystal, and he left a core group of us to do Fraggle Rock as performers. Yeah. And up until that time, I'd, I'd done Rizzo, I'd done a few other characters, but not to the extent that I'd really worked on the development of a character. But in Wembley's case, Wembley was pretty much just me. I was, I was this young 20-something-year-old guy who could never make up his mind and was, you know, kind of <laughs> flighty. And, and so a lot of, it was therapy, really. <laughs> Wembley was like me coming out through a puppet. And, and I was, I, I had a much more even hyper kind of personality than I do now. Uh, a lot of young energy, a lot of creative force. And so Wembley, I, my, one of my goals was when Wembley was in a scene, if he didn't have dialogue to say, I loved that because then I could, Wembley could just stand behind the others. If you watch any of the Fraggle, Wembley is always inserting things. He's like, I loved when he was standing between a couple of characters who were actually having a talk. And Wim, I could, Wimbley could just be back there thinking about what they're saying and trying to figure it out, and it was so much fun. And, and great to grow as a puppeteer, you know. Yeah, I, I used to liken the character to be something like a spinning top that you <laughs> put into a small room, <laughs> yes. and it would just bounce off of each of the walls. Just that's, a great, that's a great way of putting it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it, it, one of my favorite characters. I mean, so 2008 or so, uh -huh. Jason Siegel, yep. who's been like many of the people in this room, just somebody who grew up yeah, on the Muppets yeah. and is just a lifelong fan, comes to you guys with this idea, with this idea, or, or comes to the company with this script, sure, sure. and says, "I want to make sure that the Muppets are more relevant and, and yep, everything." Yep. Um, first off, what was the reaction with regards to the script that was brought to them, and how much mm. input did you guys get to put into <laughs> fleshing it out with him? Well, we certainly wanted to have input into it, and th there were a few things. Jason's original script was very funny. Uh, and there were a few changes made in order to make it a little bit more. You know, we we had this we had this attitude toward the Muppets from our point of view that they're they're not. We all know they're puppets, obviously, but we don't. But they're not puppets within their world. Their Kermit's a real frog, and so forth. You know, Piggy's mm -hmm. a real pig. Yeah. And so, and Jason had written. I think his original concept for Walter was that Walter was meant to be a puppet who wanted to go work for the Muppets. So that was a little odd for us. And Jason was okay to change that, you know. And so the, the script became a, a, a collaboration to try to get it a little bit more Muppet-like, yeah. but, but, but not to lose Jason's original vision. And then, of course, when James Bobin came on, who directed yes. it, 
It was also, then James had his vision, and so it was everyone trying to, to find the compromise to make it all work, uh, which, you know, eventually we did. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. I mean, it was, I, I was, it was an unmitigated success, and it was kind of something where the Muppets they did what it's supposed to do. It, it sure. brought them back in the spotlight again. It did, and, 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 and the, uh, just a personal thing with Jason is he and I didn't really work together all that much during the film because mm -hmm. he was mostly with Walter and other yes. characters. We did a few scenes. But I really got to know Jason when we were promoting the film. We, we, we did trips together. It ended up going all over the world with Jason Siegel, which is like I could do a whole panel on that. Mm -hmm. uh, Jason, <laughs> Jason's, I, I loved getting to know him during that time frame because when we do the promotional stuff we do, about 99% of the time, it's all just improvised. It was Kermit and Jason. Obviously, I wasn't there. It was Kermit and Jason. And playing with Jason, with Kermit, interview after interview for an entire 14-hour day, you know, you, you get asked the same questions every time, and you try to change it up for yourselves. And by the end of the day, we're both just silly with the giggles, and we were drinking Red Bull, and you know, it's just ridiculous things happening. And I had a great time getting to know him in that way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, we, we talk a lot about Muppets, and Muppet Show, Muppet yeah. and stuff. But another part <laughs> of the aspect of that is Sesame Street. Yep. Sure. And. Um, Mid early '90s, uh -huh. Sesame Street um, kind of blew up with the introduction of Elmo, right? To the point where nobody saw it coming. Right. So I'm just kind of wondering, you're 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 there with all the veteran guys doing yeah. the veteran characters, sure. And this new character comes in and just kind of goes crazy. Uh huh. Um, what was it like? What was the reaction like with everybody? And like, what type of? How was that ride? Because it must have been yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. I, I can give you a little bit on that. Now, the truth is, with Sesame Street, I I never worked on Sesame until Jim passed away, and then yes. I was doing Ernie for a, a number of years, and that was about coinciding with the same time as yeah. Elmo's yes. sudden presence. Uh, and I knew Kevin quite well. Uh, we were we were good friends, and we worked on dinosaurs and other projects together, and Labyrinth and things like that. Um, <laughs> And I think we were all extremely happy that, well, you know, I, for Sesame, anytime they, they have a character that sticks with the audience like that at any level of, of the characters, it's obviously good for their, their show and yeah. for their production and all that. Um, but, it, and it, but it was really just, a, it was kind of the, the roller coaster of once again having, a, you know, a big bird was that character for so many yes. years, you know. So, so you know, the, uh, with, the, with everything, and particularly with the Muppets, there, there's an ebb and flow of popularity. It goes up and down, and the Muppets come back again. They go away for a while, you know. And the fans know we're out there, but the mass audience waits for the next thing. And Elmo was the next thing. Yeah. You know, at that point. Yeah. It, it, it must. I, I just I, considering how massively popular that character became. Yeah. It yeah. Must have been kind of crazy. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> the, the toys, you know, and oh, people geez. people clobbering each other at Christmas time to get uh, the Tickle Me Elmo toys, and yeah. And then speaking, and it, speaking of PTSD, I'm sure there's some parents who have. Oh, PTSD, I'm sure. But, uh, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, PTSD. I keep thinking about what that could stand for. <laughs> Toy store. <laughs> so, yeah, anyway. Yeah. Uh, I and mean, you also mentioned dinosaurs, which is another show yeah, which yeah. I kind of think was before its time almost mm -hmm. to the point because it was pretty much family guy before family guy but yeah prehistoric time well it was family guy before family guy and simpsons after the simpsons it was kind of you know it was yeah. the same kind of a feel in a way absolutely but, uh, yeah a little bit of like maybe bad word to say now but uh, roseanne mixed in there as well with the family and, guy and the funny so. part of that by the way is that roseanne was shooting across the lot through all those years at the same time <laughs> the original roseanne yeah so we'd see them they'd see us you know <laughs> <laughs> too much um so i mean this may sound like an obvious question and this is, um if you guys do have questions and i encourage you to come you already you might want to start lining up because i'm going to be going to you guys very soon um and it's probably going to be it's probably going to be that one one um thing that you're going to be like that's like splitting hairs is like no no what is your favorite character that you've worked on sure well i i, I I've been asked that before, so I have yes. an answer. Uh, but but it's but it is a sincere answer. Um, as a fan, my favorite I was always drawn to Jim's characters, yes. which is why it was really a privilege for me to be able to try to carry those characters on. Um, as a performer, it's kind of a toss-up between Wembley because of because of my own development at the time, and uh, and Rizzo because Rizzo is just so snarky and it was so much fun, you know? <laughs> as, as, the, as the years went by, and Rizzo and, Rizzo and Wembley were also characters that I had originated, which yes. makes them special to me. Um, but Rizzo, 
you know, Rizzo and Kermit, over the last number of years, probably those were the two characters I would have been doing the most, with Kermit being far dominant to Rizzo. So it was always a relief, like a, like a release, to then go do Rizzo, you know, because he's so the opposite of Kermit, you know. And the fact that you snuck in a Midnight Cowboy reference in all yeah. the well, it's just insane. <laughs> cre credit where credit is due, that was Frank Oz who came up with yeah. Rizzo's name. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right. Start with your questions from you guys. Yeah, how are Go you? Ahead. Hello, Steve. Hey. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Um, so in uh, 2011, as part of the uh, build-up for the uh, movie, sure. you guys uh, did an episode of uh, WWE Monday Night Raw. Yes, we did. And I just wanted to know what that whole thing experience was like, because obviously we only saw what was on TV. Like, sure. What was it like interacting with, uh, with the other uh, wrestlers? Was there any kind of pushback, say, what are these guys doing here? Was there any, was there any negativity at all? Uh, it was one of the most fun experiences I've ever been a part of. And, and in a way, it was unexpected because I, when they said we're going to do WWD, I thought, how are we possibly going to do this? And how's it, what? I don't get it. And, it. and I was completely off base. It was, they are the nicest people on the planet. Every single wrestler, every single person behind the scenes, they're, they're really a big family. You know, they, all, they, they hate each other, you know, and they fight. <laughs> they do it. But really secretly, you yeah. know, I mean, they're wonderful people. Uh, you know, Vince McMahon, the whole crew was fantastic, and they loved getting to do something as silly for them as the Muppets and, and play it serious. So I loved every moment of it, you know. There's a guy named Hornswoggle, who's one of the wrestlers, yes. Yep. Yes. Uh, who has Muppets tattooed all over his whole body, uh, but particularly on his ankles, mm -hmm. and uh, a huge fan. And we, we haven't communicated in a little while, but we've kept in touch, and he's terrific. You know, they're all great. <laughs> all right. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Sure. Hello. 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 You can bend that down if you want. <laughs> Hi. Um, so I have kind of two connected questions. Sure. Um, the first one I wanted to ask was, what would be like an audition process to become a puppeteer? Yep. And if you had to audition to be a puppet right now, right. any of them, yeah. which one would you be? Which one would I do? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Well, <laughs> let me go with the first question first. Um, do you mean like in terms of specifically the Muppets or just as a puppeteer in general? Just as a puppeteer. Yeah, I like the if question you... better that way because yeah, me too. <laughs> there, there's a, sometimes there's a perception with people who really want to be puppeteers that the only way they can do that is they've got to work for the Muppets. And, um, you know, I, I don't think that's true. I think if you love doing something, you should just find a way to do it. Uh, it might, and it also might be a hobby. You may have to do something to pay the bills. But, <laughs> but if you want to do puppets, do it. Whether it's television or whether it's on video, whether you do, YouTube is such a great place now, or whether it's at your church or your school. Um, but to audition for somebody else, if it's hand puppets, if it's Muppet style things, I would think an audition process these days would probably be in front of a camera. You know, you're down here and the puppet's up here. And, and what's always been important to us with the Muppets is um, looking for the potential of someone to be able to, uh, the eye focus is extremely important to us. You'll hear this other places. Um, Jim had this method with almost all the characters that they, the two, you know, there are all these colors, but there's a white and black thing, and that's the pupils and the eyes. And it really, those eyes are set carefully so that they look right at the camera, and therefore they look right at each other and they can engage the audience. That's super important. And finding that focus is important. But the other part of that that I like to emphasize, and I always have with puppeteers, is it's not just eye focus, it's mental focus. The characters have to be as though they are conscious. The consciousness of these characters is everything to me um, for them to seem like a living thing. So if you're going to audition, I would think you want to bring character to it without moving them to, they don't move all the time, you know, they move when they have a reason to move, when they're, it's all about their thought process, which really makes it an acting job just like any other actor. Uh, and what would I like to do? Well, I can tell you what I'm going to do at this point. Um, I, I, I feel like Jim's spirit is something that I was mentored in in a big way. And it's something that I always wanted to carry on with the Muppets. And so I just am going to keep doing that. I mean, there's no reason why that has to belong to a particular franchise. And, and as Jim showed, he, it was in all of his work. And, um, you know, I'm, I, I've still got a lot of leers. I'm going to do my own characters and do my own stuff. Awesome. You know. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Um, 
This is kind of an odd but interesting question. Okay. Um, when you first got started doing like uh, Sesame Street and sure. Muppet Show and sure. whatnot, you sure. were doing all these characters that were basically made out of felt and whatnot. Yeah, right. And then you got into all of a sudden doing the Dark Crystal with these um, wildly imaginative, yeah. realistic looking characters. What was what was your initial reaction when you went from going from like felt to these incredibly detailed looking characters? Well, you know, it really brought about a real change in how we approached uh, our work as puppeteers. Because in Dark Crystal, it, it just so happens I did the voice on a particular character that I did, but, but generally that was not the case. The puppeteers were doing characters that were gonna be voiced later, and we weren't even 100% sure what that voice was gonna be. But for us, it was really about toning down the manipulation of the puppets and taking it from being the Muppets, which are pretty zany, and yeah, they have a life to them, but it's, but it's a little bit more abstract in a way, and then putting it into, and, and I would have to say for me, Frank set that style in many, many ways with his work, as, his original work as Yoda. It was going from this, the, the subtlety level we had with the Muppets to make them seem like they were alive, to really toning that down to a movement process that was as close as we could get to, you know, human, organic, or animal movement. We wanted them to really look alive. And when I watch The Dark Crystal these days, it, it kind of doesn't, but it kind of does. <laughs> for, the, for the time frame, yeah. that was about the best we could do with those characters. Um, and that was really, more than anything else, it was about the manipulation style. It was really trying to make them organic and alive. Cool. Yeah, Thank you. I, I do think that film holds up a little bit better than what you're. Hearing. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I know. You know, we did Jen and Kara, which were <laughs> yeah. really very humanist, humanoid, and um, it was always a challenge. You know, did they want to try to build a mouth that did? You know, did it do O's and O's and Oz? And really, it wasn't possible at the time to yeah. do that without a very complicated rig. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we went for the simple, just the subtlety of how much the mouth opened. The Muppets are these big wide mouths, yeah. and then it was this little tiny movement as the thing talks, you know, and, and keeping I, it subtle. And in a way, I get it, those, those kind of are the precursors to what happened with Walter yep. later on. Because yes. Because you kind of probably brought some of those techniques into that character. Sure, as well. you mean like the whistling and stuff? Yeah. Yeah, yeah well, I love that. And, and, the way, and the way that the, the actual character was designed yep. with the more humanoid features. And oh, Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Exactly. Yeah, so. yeah. Yeah. Hey. Hi. Hey. Okay, my favorite uh, movie is the Christmas one. comes out every year with my daughter and I. Um, the Christmas <laughs> Carol one? No, no, no. No, it's I was going to say because family Christmas. we did a bunch of where Muppet Jim Christmas is, specials. Where, where Jim Henson's in the fragments yes, yes. at the grandma's house. Yeah, yeah. Now, how fun was that doing that? Well, it was great. And it's funny that you're talking about that because I've had a bunch of people come to me and say that just this morning already at the, at the like, back of the booth. And so we've had a lot of conversation about it. It was really fun because it was one of the few times when, you know, as you know, characters from all the different realms of Jim's yeah. kind of imagination came into one place as though they were celebrating together. Um, but for me, a particular memory was, I think I mentioned that Carol Spinney was the reason I was recruited into the Muppets to begin with. And yet Carol and I had hardly ever worked together up to that point in the late 80s because he was on Sesame, I wasn't. I'm doing other things with Jim and, you know, we kept in touch, but we weren't in the same place. And we actually did a scene with Oscar and Rizzo together. Just, I think it was just the two of us as well as I remember. He's outside of the trash can, which was perfect. And I know we both just rejoiced. It was so much fun to get to work together with those two kind of similar characters in a way, you know. But great fun. And the scene at the end with Jim and Sprocket, you know, oh, wow. how special that was, you know. Um, how, uh, oh, what was I going to say? Which movie do you like the best that you did? Well, of the, of the, of the films that we did, um, I mean, I'm partial to the very first Muppet movie. It was the first film. Oh, that film. was good, too. It was great. And, <laughs> and, and I had just joined the Muppets like two months before that. Um, and so it was obviously my first film, but it was also everyone in the Muppets' first film, really. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm 19 years old and I'm off to California and I just got married and I've got my little apartment and I go to work every day and get to work with the Muppets, you know. Doesn't get much better than that no, for a fan. No. Uh, and it was a great learning experience and so, you know, and, and there was a lot of work. I mean, I was working every day and, and in there doing something every day uh, as, as already feeling like a part of that sort of core group to a certain degree. Yeah. Um, so, you know, but, but probably my second favorite film is The Muppet Christmas Carol because it was my first real uh, major performance <laughs> as, as Kermit, you know. Yeah. yeah. 
And it was it was important to all of us who were working on the film because it was very shortly after Jim's death, and yeah. so to keep that going on, you know, and to, to feel like this film is working and it's going to really work, and you know, we're all together. Jerry Jewell was still around doing working with us, you know. Do as you a mind writer. if I ask one more thing? Uh, please. Okay. Um, thing I like about it is it's for kids, but it's so for adults. Y yeah. You know, yeah. my I remember my sister being in Guelph University, uh -huh. and everybody would watch it. <clears throat> on you know when it came out once sure, a week sure and they all loved it you know i like the humor it's <clears throat> it's both ways yeah well you know many of you may know this because you are fans that jim never thought of the muppets as being for children <laughs> uh and and sesame street even on sesame street you know in the early days my understanding was from jim and frank that they were never thinking that they were talking to children. They were doing what they loved doing and making themselves laugh. And there was a curriculum, of course, of teaching letters and numbers and concepts. But they were just having fun. Well, and sure so children. there was really no difference between what they were for them on Sesame Street and going to do the Ed Sullivan show or whatever they were doing at the time. Well, children would probably have enjoyed being talked to as adults. Yeah, you know? well, that was kind of the point, I think. But I'll let other people. Yeah, no, Thanks. sure. Nice to talk to you. Sure. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> Sir, it's an honor to meet you. In this Thank room, you. two years ago, I did the interview with Carol Spinney. So oh, this good. is another step for me. Fantastic. So I've been reading online lately when I learned you were coming. And yeah. in 2005, uh -huh. um, a movie about Fraggle Rock was pitched. Yes. And in 2011, Joseph Gordon-Levitt, I believe, signed on to produce it. Right. So what's the story with that? I well, I only, I'm very much on the outside of that whole thing. I, I'm sort of like you. I look on the internet and they, they would say, we're going to do a Fraggle film. And then, you know, ever, however many years later, we, now we've got someone here who's going to... I have no clue. Um, you know, the Henson uh, company sold, obviously, the Muppets to Disney, and they sold the Sesame characters to, to children... Uh, Sesame Workshop now. It used to be to Children's Television Workshop. And they still own the Fraggles. Um, but why it hasn't actually happened, I don't quite know. Um, uh, but I would assume it's the business side of it. Eventually, it probably will. You know, eventually they'll they'll find the right group and the right producers and the right financers to get the thing off the ground. I assume it will happen. Whether or not any of the original guys will be involved, it, it's probably there's a handful of us. Well, there's four of us left. Um, I can't imagine whether we would be or not. You know. Uh, th th I would expect them to probably work with new puppeteers and maybe new Fraggle characters, although I've heard it said that they might use the, the same cast, which I think would be the smart thing to do. But, you know, there, there was a, a really a strong... I go back to this a lot. There was There's a, a real kind of an intangible spirit that, that surrounded that show, an atmosphere and an environment we were working in that was very unique to the, the time frame. And my hope would be that whatever happens, whether it's with the Muppets or with Fraggle in particular, because it meant so much to those of us who were on it, is that that spirit can be recaptured. And that's going to be hard, because it really was about Jim and, uh, and the way he set things into motion. And it would be difficult for that to happen at this point. So secretly, there's this little kind of part of me that would just as soon it didn't happen in a way. It's like when they remake a lot of films. I, I kind of think, let's just do, let's just, it is what it was, and it was wonderful. And sure, you can update it, and you can make it, try to make it more modern. And then young fans will call it their own. I understand that, and it's a money-making thing. But there's still something about those original things that really hold up to me, you know? Uh, and it, so it's, I just, it, I hope as people move forward and, and try to produce new stuff, it, they at least honor that, you know? I hope that answers your question a little bit. Thanks. It doesn't exactly answer it, because I don't have any idea. What <laughs> Thanks anyway. Sure, sure, sure. How you doing? Hey, good. <laughs> okay. So my question for you, and I think I know your answer. Okay. There's, there's a movie coming out this year called yeah. The Happy Time Murders. Yeah, yeah, And yeah. it's done by Jim's son. Right. And there's lawsuits and all yes. sorts of stuff, certainly. <laughs> yes. Now, do you view a movie like that as a fun adult parody or yeah. a slap in the face, essentially, to the franchise? No, I don't think so. It's a, it's a new franchise. None of those characters are sure. from any particular existing franchise. Um, I, you know, I'm so on the outside of it at this point. Of course. But but I know Brian has developed that film for a long time, and and I don't I'm not offended by the adult side of you know they do the puppets up thing that they did, which was evidently extremely adult humor. Uh, I think as long as everybody knows what they're going to see, it's fine. Um, but I, I think if Sesame wanted to to distinguish themselves from it, I think they accomplished that. Uh, it's a shame it has to be a lawsuit, but but 
at least at least people know it's not them, and that was their concern. Uh, it's not. I don't. Uh, you know, my speculation is just my opinion would be that it's not about winning a lawsuit. It's about everyone knowing that that's not us. You know, and now yeah. it's going to move forward. You know, sure. that's really the important thing. Are you going to see it? I'm sure. What's that? You're going to see it. You're going to check it out. I'm sure I will. Okay. I'm sure, sure I will. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Sure. Hey. Just hey. A, just a fast question for you. You know, if you were um, standing, if you were in a film studio right now, your top of your head would disappear. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> It's okay, there's nothing, oh, yeah, nothing yeah. of value in there anyway. Um, I was just going to ask you, um, you worked with the, pro uh, the project for, for Labyrinth. Did yeah, you, yeah. Uh, what was it like working with the, like, the likes of David Bowie and yeah, stuff? Yeah, it was amazing. Jim came to us, well, we were doing Fraggle at the time. Mm -hmm. And I remember him, he was off doing that a lot. And he would come in once in a while and he would do this character named Convincing John on Fraggle and a couple things, or maybe direct a show and then he'd go off again. And he came in and was telling us about where he was in the project. And I remember him saying, you know, um, I'm looking at you know, a couple of people for this lead role of this character, Jareth, and uh, I think he was looking at Sting, and and then he said Sting or David Bowie, you know, and, and I and I love Sting. I mean, the, you know, of course, but I kind of had this secret thing, and I just said, Oh, Jim, you know, I love Sting, but could we? Can we? Can it be David Bowie? And he said, Well, I, you know, we'll, you know, I think it was the better choice. I was a massive <laughs> Bowie fan, and I was still, you know, I was kind of just barely out of high school. And, you know, I was in these high school rock bands where we played all David Bowie's music. So it was a huge deal for me. Yeah. And I made a complete fool of myself the first time I met him. Jim had this little advanced party, pre-production party at his house. And we were all going there to meet David Bowie and Jennifer Connelly and all these people. And puppeteers were there. And it was a small thing. And uh, I was, you know, I was rarely starstruck, but I was starstruck with David Bowie. And I was introduced. He's very humble and quiet. And I said, you know, nice to meet you. And I said... It, the stupidest thing in the world. I said, um, you, you'll have to forgive me if over the first part of the shooting, I'm just like staring at you a lot because I'm such a huge fan. And he kind of, he was smiled and, and almost blushed and recoiled. And he did, and he, you know, He's he said, tensed up. and then he was away. And I did talk to him for the whole rest of the evening. And I thought, oh, no. I got to go work with this guy. So he basically blew it. pulled it back away, slowly smile and nod. Exactly that thing. <laughs> and then about two weeks into production, we're leaving the dailies. You know, the dailies at the end of the day, we go see the stuff from the day before. And I'm walking ahead, and I've got to get back to my little place where I'm staying in a hotel. And someone runs up behind me, and they grab me on the shoulders. And, you know, and I turn around, and it was David Bowie. We work together by now. And he said, hey, I've, it, it, there's all these other people around. For whatever reason, in that moment, he chose me. And he said, hey, I, um, I, I've got to go upstairs and get my makeup. He's still in the makeup, you know. I've got to go upstairs and get the makeup. You want to come up and hang out? Wow. <laughs> wow. I mean, I'll never forget that. Experience. I missed awesome. my ride. I barely got home. <laughs> <laughs> Who cares? Yes. Who cares? Yes. <laughs> yeah, it was Thank great. You so Thank much. you. Yeah. Just, uh, <laughs> Uh, just just uh, before you get into your question I know I'm taking a long there. time. I'm no, sorry. No, no. By all means, that's why we're here. Okay, good. good. Um, but um, we are starting to get close to the end of what we're gonna, of our panel here today. So we're going to try and get to everybody who's already in line right now, but that's probably going to be it, just so you guys know. Sorry. I so go right ahead with your question. I hope my answers are sufficient for everybody. <laughs> if you don't get to ask. Uh, first of all, uh, I think you for coming. It's an honor to meet you. Oh, you uh, too. You uh, too. I saw your Wimbley. Uh, I just want to say, uh, well, first of all, I, mean, I think my favorite Muppet movies were you know, the Muppets Take Manhattan and yeah. Muppet Treasure Island. Mm -hmm. uh, I say, you know, of all the celebrities you men worked with on the Muppet Show and uh, Muppets Tonight, do you have a favorite? Uh, yeah, you know, it's it, it's hard to choose a favorite because it was the Muppet Show was coming in every week. It was a new celebrity every week, and so many of them I had grown up with as a kid, you know, and classic Hollywood stars, Bob Hope and Danny Kaye and these people. Um, but the first Muppet show I ever did was uh, the Alice Cooper episode. And again, you know, <laughs> Dave, David Bowie, Alice Cooper, you know, <laughs> right up my alley as a, rock, as a rock, rock and roller, you know. And so that, I, I, I mean, I could go on, but that's, I will say that's my favorite. And, and I hope he's watching if anybody's shooting this because uh, I think I'm going to run into him at some Comic Cons. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Yeah, thank you. Good thank to you. good thank to talk you. to you. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you can. You can. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Okay. All these tall people. In the oh, I know, I know. <laughs> All right. Um, 
Well, uh, first of all, you mentioned the Alice Cooper thing. That's He's got one of my favorite Muppets, Silverbeak. Awesome, right? Oh, so, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But uh, now my question is this. Um, now, I know that you've parted ways with the uh, with the Disney arm mm. of, of the Muppets. Right. Um, but, of course, as you mentioned before, there's still, you know, there's still Sesame Workshops branch. Yep. There's still the Hensons and stuff, and they do the Fraggles and the Creature Shop. Right. Um, do you still have opportunities to do anything more with those branches as well, or is it completely done? Yeah, well, it may be completely done, hmm. um, and it's and it's kind of okay. Um, you know, I'm at a place now where I, as I, I think I said this earlier, I didn't realize how hard I was working, and and it meant and it was such an emotional thing for me as well. Uh, and the importance of Jim's influence, staying a part of this, was really my goal. And I had begun to feel that that was not quite the same as it used to be. Um, and so it, it, it's really okay with me. I, I really feel comfortable carrying that on outside of that. You know, it was funny with Jim. He never looked back. And he never, um, and, and I kind of mean never. We went to a, he had a big company meeting one time, and a bunch of the young people like me at the time were watching a lot of his old work, like the specials he did in the 70s. And we wanted him to watch with us, and he went, no, you know, I, that was, I don't really want to watch that. He didn't want to be influenced by it. He didn't want to think about the past. He wanted to keep moving forward. And, and that's kind of the way I'm looking at this. At the same time, I know how important it is for Jim's influence to stay a part of the Muppets. And that's going to be really hard in all of those different places now. Um, there aren't a lot of folks left who had any direct contact with Jim. So it, it becomes kind of... Um, it thins out, you know what I mean, as time goes on. And my goal had always been to really keep that alive. And, you know, it's not always possible to do that, unfortunately. Uh, so it, I have no real regrets, but it, it, we'll, we'll see what happens. You know, I, if I have any, it will be what happens to the Muppets next, you gotcha. know. All right, well, thank Shall you. I mean, sure, sure, sure. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a big fan, and uh, I, I wanted to ask you about Sprocket. I'm, I'm, I'm not listening to you. I'm listening to, the, you know, yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, um, I know that there were a lot of international different Doc and Sprockets. Yes. And I was wondering if you were Sprocket in all of them, since he's pantomime. And, uh, the, well, uh, that's a good question. Um, and I, I wasn't in the end. Uh, there's a, a, a really brilliant performer named David Barclay. Okay. who is uh, a, a longtime Muppet associate. He's not involved anymore with the Muppets, but David's terrific. And I went, the story is, I did the, the original version that we shot in, here in Toronto and uh, working with Jerry Parks, an amazing guy. And then the first co-production we did was in Germany, in Berlin. And so we go off to Berlin, a handful of us were doing this thing. And I thought, well, I don't speak any German, but it's, like you say, pantomime. So I thought, this will be fine. Uh, and the first moment of the first day with the actor playing the part that was Doc, he turns to Sprocket, he says something in German, and I went, oh my God, I have no clue what to do. I was totally <laughs> lost. So we got through that, but I remember saying, I, I, I don't speak any other languages. I, don't, I think I probably can't do this. And plus, we were doing the, what we considered to be sort of the main production here. And because I was doing Wembley as well, I couldn't be away. So we ended up having to get another team. David Barclay and Mike Quinn, who's a great puppeteer, they did Sprocket in most of those other countries. And I imagine it must have been awesome working with Jerry Parks because he, he seemed oh, like the sweetest person in, in the world. Just the nicest guy in the world. Uh -huh. Nicest guy in the world. Loved it. And, and it would have never worked without Jerry because the truth is, as an actor, Jerry Parks was really delivering all Sprocket's lines, too, because Sprocket's just there being a dog. And, he, and you could sort of tell what Sprocket meant, but Jerry had to memorize his lines, and he had to know what Sprocket was trying to say, because he had to make sure the, you know, it was all on Jerry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both for your question. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, exactly. Uh, you've got, you're up, uh, you're on the last seat here, so. Okay. You better get Thanks. dizzy. Uh, <laughs> lots of great answers. I. Uh, You've told us uh, what your favorite uh, Henson films were. What about uh, films uh, not from uh, the Hensons? You mean like uh, just anybody, any yeah, film anything. in the world? What, what's great well, stuff that we may have missed? My goodness, I have a long list. <laughs> <laughs> I was a huge Rocky Horror fanatic when I was in high school. That was right about the time it was all happening. 
So much so that we used to dress up. I, would, I won't show you the pictures, but I, I made a mean Frankenfurter. I'm just saying. Uh, this was my teenage years. We'd go down and stand on the street corner in the middle of the night for both shows and do the whole thing. And then when I first got to England, it was only a few years after the film had come out. It, and of course, it was a massive, you know, st a straight stage show production in London, which was still going on. And my wife and I, you know, I would go down on the weekends as though it was the film and sit in the front row. Now, you didn't do all the participation because they got really annoyed with you when they're trying to act on stage. But we would go down, and it was a weekly thing. You know, we were just insane. So Rocky Horror was a big influence in the early days. Um, recently, I love things like, I love the Coen Brothers movies. I think they would be wonderful to work with. Uh, you know, oh brother, where art thou? And weird things like that. You know, a a a a, a puppet-driven Cohen Brothers movie. <laughs> <You> just <laughs> listen. It's all in here. It's all in here. I, I, I would love to see that. But yes, I actually had meant uh, puppetry films. Sorry. Oh I, oh <laughs> oh, you mean puppet films? It, you're I, I really don't. <laughs> I, I really don't watch puppet films. <laughs> actually, there's a little bit of truth to that because. Um, I'd rather sit down and watch people who are doing things on YouTube these days mm -hmm. with puppets because I think it's more indicative of what's going on out there maybe than puppet films. Nothing against things that are being made. Um, I don't have an answer because the, it's kind of true. And I also don't want to be overly influenced by them. Mm -hmm. um, nice. You know, I'd rather just do have what's going on in here going on in here rather than being influenced by somebody else's work. You know? Does that make sense? Yeah. I think it does. Thanks. Yeah. Sure. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Um, as we um, as we wrap up here, I have one one last thing I kind of want to ask you about. Sure. Um, a couple of years ago, there was a big meme on the internet that started where they took classic Sesame Street and uh -huh. Muppet Show uh -huh. fit, uh, skits and redubbed them with popular songs. Yes. And I'm yes. kind of wondering what your reaction was first to seeing Bert and Ernie being redubbed to a gangster rap song. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know. Uh, from the point of view, objectively looking at it, I thought they were, some of them were really well done. Yeah. I mean, like the lip sync was perfect, you know, and some of the Kermit ones. And then there were some that I felt like maybe went a little too far. <laughs> there, were, there were, you know, Kermit shooting up with a lot of drugs and stuff, and I thought, e okay. Yeah. But at the same time, during that time frame, we weren't producing a lot of material. And I remember saying to the executives, you know, if this bothers you guys, understand that if we're not going to be doing things, the fans are going to do it for us. Yeah. And, and some of those fans are going to do this kind of stuff. So you can't be angry about it. I mean, you can't have a problem with it. That people want the Muppets, and they and so they're just going to reinvent them for us. So Absolutely. so maybe we should be doing something. You know? Absolutely. <laughs> you know? Absolutely. I think that's a great way to finish off. I want to thank you guys for coming out to this Q&A yeah, today. Yeah, thank you all. I want to thank Steve for coming, especially. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you for watching the Convention Junkies coverage of the 2018 Niagara Falls Comic Con. Please like, comment and subscribe to see more, and let us know below what you think of this video. If you would like to help us with future projects, please visit our Patreon page.